here last week, had a great week. Uh, those who have missed a week or have never come before, welcome. Uh, and tonight we're going to talk about insurance planning as the final installment for the transition to practice. Uh, as Ali said, hold the questions to the end and I will stay as long as there are questions. Uh, and I'm happy to entertain individual questions afterwards. You can either send me an email, brian at brianschumack.com, or if you didn't write that down or don't write that down, uh, we can always you can always reach out to Ali, uh, who will forward it off to me. So without further uh, uh, preamble, let's move right in. So first and foremost, let's just quickly review what a financial plan includes. And it does include all of the areas that you see on your screen. Uh, cash flow management is in the middle because it impacts every single area that there is to do about your well-being financially. We then look at insurance planning, which we're going to cover tonight, which is, you know, in essence, a protection of that income that you uh, go out and earn. Tax planning, making sure that you're uh, not paying a penny more than you need to. Investment planning, maximizing every extra dollar that you have. And then legal estate planning is wills, powers of attorney and that kind of stuff. And how does it apply to you? And in the uh, transition to practice uh, webinars that we've had, we also focused on business structures and that is uh, previously recorded. So you can reach out and look at that at any time. And again, if you have questions because you will have suffered through one of these talks, uh, by all means, reach out or reach out to Ali. So let's talk about what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about protecting one's ability to earn an income and the preservation of one's assets. And that's what we're going to focus on today in the financial plan. Our agenda, we're going to look at life insurance, disability insurance, critical illness insurance, talk about medical and health and dental coverage. Also look at what you need to know as if you're a clinic owner and are looking at putting some benefits in place, or if you're an independent contractor, what your options are, or if you're an employee, what your options are. So let's, oh, and we'll obviously open the floor open for questions. So let's take a look at the first thing. And really very important when you're talking any type of insurance on an individual basis, it's going to be one of two things. So as time goes on, the cost of insurance increases on an annual basis. So what an insurance company will do is they'll price out what that cost is for each and every year that you're in existence, and then they'll offer you different premium structures. And the first premium structure is one that increases on a generally a 10 or 20 year basis, commonly referred to as term insurance, and it steps up and as it goes on, you can see the cost of it gets quite prohibitive in nature. Then it stops. So term insurance is exactly that, it's term. It's good for a specific period of time. Usually in today's marketplace, programs go until 70, 75 or 80. Then you have one where the cost of insurance, you pay more in the early years, but the premium never increases. And that's commonly referred to as permanent insurance. Now, when it comes to life insurance and critical illness insurance, you've got both the yellow and the blue plan. When it comes to group benefits or individual medical plans, it's sort of a variation on the black dots where it increases. And then when it comes to disability insurance, that is only available in the blue plan. And so you'll pay a little bit more, but it stays the same uh, and doesn't increase. One of the things that is really very important to determine is how long you're going to need your insurance. Because the crossover to where the yellow and the blue plan, you will have spent about the same amount of money on it, is it at, at about the 30th year. So if you only need to cover a liability, for example, like a mortgage, where it's going to be paid off over a 25-year period, what you have there is probably looking better at a yellow plan than paying more than you need to in the early years because you're not going to benefit from maintaining it in the later years. When it comes to final expenses, funeral costs, tax liabilities in your estate, 
In that instance, you're looking at a blue plan unless you intend to die early because the longer that you live, and one certainly hopes you live more than 30 years, presuming that you're young and watching this, if you're in your 70s or 80s, may you still live uh, another 30 years or more. But if you're looking at covering lifetime coverage, you're better off in a blue plan, which costs you more now, but costs you significantly less later on. So now let's look specifically at life insurance. Life insurance is the type of insurance that provides a lump sum tax-free benefit at death. So unlike in some other countries in the world, life insurance proceeds, when they're received as a beneficiary, they are not subject to taxation. There are two types of premium plans, as I discussed, term insurance and permanent insurance. Term insurance was that yellow, where it sort of staircases as you get older. Permanent insurance is the blue plan, whereby it does not increase in cost as you get older. And there are perm permutation, permut permutations, excuse me, of both term and permanent insurance. Often people say, well, Brian, I want mortgage insurance. Well, what that is, is a term insurance program. What you're getting at the bank is called, for marketing purposes, mortgage insurance. And mortgage insurance in, is a variation of term insurance, or it can be just a straight term insurance program. But there is no such thing as mortgage insurance. That is a marketing term. And so don't be duped by saying, I have to get mortgage insurance when I have a mortgage, because you don't need mortgage, mortgage insurance in order to secure a mortgage, despite what you might face when you're meeting with a bank individual or a mortgage broker, you don't have to have life insurance in order to qualify for that mortgage. In fact, I, I've been diabetic since I was 22 months old, and I've had mortgages in the past. And in the bank questions, I would never have qualified for those programs. And so it's important to understand that uh, when you're talking about mortgage insurance through an institution like a bank, uh, generally it does not make sense. And I say generally, sometimes it may but I've not seen a situation where it really does. So having insurance on lines of credit, having insurance to eliminate credit card debts if you pass away, having mortgage insurance to eliminate the mortgage, the only entity that is going to benefit from that is the institution that you're borrowing the money from because they're the beneficiary on that. Whereas having an individual program you can name the beneficiary whomever you choose it to be. So if I had a mortgage and I wanted to insure it, I would never go to a bank because I would want my spouse to have the ability to and choose to pay off the mortgage or maintain the mortgage and use the money elsewhere. So that flexibility doesn't occur when you're talking insurance through a bank. The other thing when you're talking about mortgage insurance in particular or credit card insurance uh, where balances are coming into question, you have to take a look at the costs. Often the costs are exorbitant because understand there's seldom a differentiation between a smoker and a non-smoker and between a younger individual and an older individual. So if you're a young, healthy female, you're paying more than you need to because there's going to be an older smoking male in there and you're going to be seen as equal. And that really shouldn't be the case. So why have insurance? Eliminate debt that survives you and replace lost income in the event that there are those who are dependent on you. And the third is to accommodate for your final expenses such as funeral costs and the like. So if you are just starting out in life, you have a pile of student debt, be it national student debt or a student line of credit at one of the institutions. Again, you do not need to have that insured. And the only time I would recommend it is if that debt is going to survive you. 
because if you're an individual and you were able to get the line of credit without someone else co-signing and you pass away, if your estate has zero in the way of assets and only the student line of credit outstanding or the national student loan outstanding, your estate doesn't have the assets to pay off the debts, it'll go bankrupt. It is not the responsibility of family members unless or spouses, unless someone has co-signed for that debt. The only other time that it would make sense to have insurance is if you did have assets. So you had a property where you had no mortgage on it and you had a student line of credit. If you pass away, the student line of credit, that institution is going to uh, try and commandeer their money from your estate where the value of that property is going to go into your estate. If the house is jointly owned with someone else, they're not going to be able to access that because that house wouldn't go into your estate. So please, the important thing here to remember is that take a look at what debts will go into your estate and what is in the estate. And is there enough to pay off that debt? If there isn't, then you probably don't need the insurance on that debt. If someone has co-signed that debt, be it a spouse, be it a parent, be it a relative, friend, whatever, then they're on the hook if you don't make that payment. That debt does survive you. Replacing lost income. So when you're young and starting out in life, you have the greatest potential earning capability. And someone that earns in around $70,000 a year in their mid-20s, by the time they reach age 65, they're going to have earned probably in around $5 million. Now, if you were to pass away very young, then the question is, how much of that remaining $5 million is someone else going to acquire? So if you have a husband and uh, or you have two spouses and one of them passes away, the question is, can the surviving spouse maintain their standard standard of living. But if one spouse isn't working and one is, then the question is, can the spouse who's not working be able to go out and earn enough money to maintain that standard of living? So at that point, you might look to replace income. The other thing that is becoming much more popular and, and common these days is where children are earning money and they're helping support their parents who may be coming close to retirement. So if you are like you're in a situation where your parents may be dependent on you for your income and you predecease their death, then they may, may need a continuation of your income as well. So before you jump out and get life insurance, make sure that you actually need it. And if you're not sure, make sure you speak to someone who's familiar with insurance and insurance planning. And obviously, uh, as a financial planner, that is one of the areas that I am able to speak to. Insurance is an investment. And I left this to come up next. There are a lot of Finfluencers and there are a lot of insurance salespeople who will try and put you into a life insurance plan and say, hey, this is good because you can save inside the insurance contract. That's true. But that applies to less than a quarter percent of the population. Because before you use insurance as an investment vehicle, you better have no debt, including no mortgage. You better have maximized your RSPs. You better have maximized your tax-free savings accounts. If you have children, you better have maximized the RESPs. You should still have a non-registered investment portfolio. And after you have all that, do you still even need life insurance? If you still need life insurance, then life insurance can be used as a tax-deferred investment vehicle. If you don't meet all those criteria and a person says to you, you should use insurance as a savings vehicle, then I would politely show them the door. They are likely working in their pocketbook's best interest and not yours. 
So again, you have to be quite affluent and you still need insurance before insurance could be used as a savings vehicle. And again, a lot of people on the internet are touting insurance as a savings vehicle. And frankly, having seen it for the last 35 plus years, uh, there will probably always be people touting insurance as a savings vehicle. But in reality, it really is only going to apply to less than a quarter percent of the population. And may you be affluent enough that you're in that quarter percent. But if you're not, don't look to insurance as a savings vehicle. Let's talk about disability insurance. As physios, you run into individuals probably on a fairly regular basis who are incapacitated and not able to work. And that means that they're often dependent on a, an insurance company for disability benefits. The problem is, number one, not enough people have disability insurance. And number two, a lot of people will depend on what they have through a place of employment. And although it's disability insurance, it's pretty weak in nature. So what does disability insurance do? It is the type of insurance that replaces your income in the event that you're unable to work. And it usually only does that replacement as long as you remain disabled or until age 65. And otherwise, it, it doesn't apply. There are three definitions of disability, and this is very important. So there's what's called own occupation. That means if you can't be practicing as a physiotherapist, whether you are or are not working elsewhere is irrelevant. You will be paid your disability benefit because you cannot practice as a physiotherapist. Regular occupation says you are disabled if you can't practice as a physiotherapist and you are not working elsewhere. So again, own occupation, whether you work elsewhere or not, it makes no difference. Regular occupation says if you can't be a physio and you are not working elsewhere, you're totally disabled. Any occupation, the definition says that you are deemed to be totally disabled in the event that you are unable to resume any occupation that you are suitably trained for. I always joke and say, if you can lick stamps, you have a suitable occupation. It's not quite that bad, but understand that if you are, unless you are, uh, have a brain injury, as a physiotherapist, there, it doesn't mean that you can't do some intellectual position, even if you can't help someone in a physical therapy manner. And so therefore, in any occupation definition is a very weak definition when you look at the other two. And what you'll find in most group benefit plans, so if you're an employee, you have through your place of employment a benefit plan, it's almost always two years of your own occupation, followed by any occupation thereafter. So for two years, if you can't practice as a physiotherapist, you're covered. After that, if you can lick stamps, you're no longer covered. And so the benefit package for disability through a group benefit plan is very weak, and you really can't depend on it unless you have a catastrophic situation for more than about two years. As an individual applying for disability insurance, a physiotherapist, especially in the early years of their career, are only going to be able to qualify based on a regular occupation definition meaning that if you can't be a physio and you're not working elsewhere, it will pay. Understand that with a regular occupation definition, if you can't be a physiotherapist, there is no one that is insisting that you go to work. So if you can't be a physio and you choose not to work, then you're deemed to be disabled. If you choose to work, you can't practice as a physio, but you can work as a teacher teaching math, then what ends up happening is it's not a total disability any longer. You now look at a partial disability, and that's the next part. And there are two types of partial disability. So partial disability is based on time. It states that in the event that you cannot resume your job, 
more than 50% of the time, then you're deemed to be partially disabled. So if you can work two out of five days, that's a partial disability. What that means is that you will get a partial benefit payout to you. So if you had $5,000 and you were disabled 40%, you would get a benefit of $1,000, okay? Representing, sorry, $2,000, representing 40% of your disability benefit. Residual disability states that if there is an income loss, whether you can work full-time or not, then there is, again, a partial payout. Where would that be applicable? Uh, let's say that as a uh, clinician, you're able to practice full-time, but you can't see as many patients because of some disability incapacitation. So let's say you can only see 50% of the patients you would normally see, and your income has dropped. So yes, there's a loss in time, but there's also a loss of income, and you would then qualify on whichever one uh, you choose to. Most of the programs out there, it's one or the other, okay? So group benefits versus individual plans. So when it comes to group benefits, the only advantage to a group benefit plan for disability insurance is, it is its cost is much lower. And there's sort of a rule of thumb uh, that is jokingly spoken about when it comes to disability insurance. And that's the more that you pay for it, the more likely you are to get paid uh, in the event of a claim. The less that you pay for it, the less likely you are to get paid in the event of a claim. And so when it comes to group benefits, the only advantage to a group benefit disability plan is that it is inexpensive. When you look at a personal program, however, you don't have to stay at the job. You can move from one job to another. You can take your disability with you. Most personal disability plans should have what's called cost of living adjustment to it, whereby if you're disabled today, every year that you're disabled, your benefit goes up. Unless you're working for a large entity, such as a hospital, uh, your group benefit plan is not likely going to have an indexing, in essence, of your disability benefit. The other thing that you're looking at with a group plan is they can force you to rehabilitate or retrain for a position uh, that you're able to be trained for and then the benefit stops. Whereas a personal plan, there's no forced rehabilitation. In fact, if you wish to rehabilitate, they will often help you financially during that time. The goal in both instances is to get you off of the disability payment as soon as possible. The group plan is to force you off of it. The individual plan is to encourage you to find something else to do and therefore no longer require it. If you can't tell, I'm not overly excited about someone depending on a benefit plan that they have through a place of employment. You're far better off getting an individual plan. Let's now talk about critical illness insurance. This is the kind of insurance that pays you a lump sum of money, tax-free, after 30 days following the diagnosis or occurrence of a catastrophic event. The most common catastrophic events, 85%, come from cancer, heart attack, stroke, or bypass. Before you say, well, I have no family history of that, I don't need it, understand that statistically, I mean, the Canadian Cancer Society has said that 50% of individuals are going to develop cancer between now and the day they die. The thing is that 30 years ago, that would also have meant that, you know, close to that 50% were also going to die pretty soon after being diagnosed. Nowadays, there are very few cancers remaining, whereby it's a true death sentence in a terminal illness. For the most part, cancer, heart attack, stroke, and bypass these days, you can live a long time following it. However, the benefit to critical illness is not to give you a lump sum that you won a lottery, it's to give you the financial freedom to focus on recovery and not focus on paying bills. All companies out there use a standardized set of definitions. So if you had a heart attack, you're either going to qualify with all the companies or none of them. 
So what it really boils down to when it comes to critical illness insurance is your gender, your smoking status, your family history, and your age. There are about a dozen companies in the marketplace that provide critical illness coverage. And for the most part, it really is a matter of, uh, I mean, almost all of them will have the top four. And then it's a matter of whether there's any of the remaining 20 plus illnesses that they're going to have in that program that you feel more compelled to protect against. By the way, and I'll jump back for a quick second, with disability insurance, there are only two primary disability insurance carriers remaining in the marketplace, Canada Life and RBC. When it comes to being a physiotherapist, RBC generally is the better place to secure your individual disability coverage from because it is often less expensive, because RBC ranks physiotherapists better than does Canada Life, okay? Back to critical illness, as I said, generally there's a coverage of 24 plus illnesses. If you are shown a program that covers four or six programs, six illnesses only, then you're saving maybe 10% on the premium, but you're also only covered for those illnesses. There are no more illnesses uh, covered other than cancer, heart attack, stroke, and bypass. And unless you have a medical reason for not being able to qualify for the full kit and caboodle, I would recommend that you apply for the full kit and caboodle yeah, for the whole benefit, 24 plus illnesses. Most employee benefit plans these days uh, that are going to offer a critical illness benefit, they're offering about $25,000. There are some that are starting to offer 50. But let me tell you something that it is my belief that the minimum amount of critical illness that someone should have is equal to two years worth of your expenses. Not necessarily your income, but your expenses. Meaning that in the event that you were uh, to be diagnosed or you would in incur or have a, an um, incapacitation occur that was covered, you don't have to worry about covering your expenses for two years. That's the minimum. The maximum that I would implement when it comes to critical illness insurance is elimination of any debt that you have and two years worth of income. So there is that minimum two years expenses to the maximum two years income plus elimination of debt. So obviously, 25000 unless you are living uh, a very restricted lifestyle, 25000 is not enough coverage and you should definitely... Uh, maintain coverage outside of work. I often get a question, well, Brian, do I need both critical illness and disability insurance? And the answer is yes. Because understand disability insurance, 75,000 income, you're protecting $5 million or more of income earning capability. Critical illness, you're looking at a much shorter window. Your needs are gonna be more upfront. And in order to secure $5 million of critical illness, first of all, you can't because it's not available in the industry. But in order to secure that, the premium would be exorbitant. And that's why critical illness covers sort of the short term, disability covers the long term, and you can qualify and claim and get paid on both of them about 20% of the time. 80% of the time, you're only going to be able to claim on one or the other. And if you have a crystal ball that tells you which one you might need, then I would like to borrow the crystal ball because then I will sit down with everyone the day before they have their uh, critical illness, their heart attack, et cetera. So now let's talk about medical uh, or health insurance. Usually there's four major components to a program. There's drug coverage, paramedical services, hospital coverage, and travel coverage. Those are the four major components. Drug coverage, what you've got is uh, generally in a, it's an individual plan or a group plan. They're gonna cover generic equivalents only. Uh, so unless a program states otherwise, uh, you cannot replace a generic with a name brand drug. I know that sometimes there are uh, secondary reasons, lactose intolerance, et cetera, whereby 
the name drug is required. In a situation like that, you're going to be paying part of that cost because the reimbursement will be based on the generic element. Paramedical services, chiropractic, naturopathic, uh, uh, psychotherapy, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, uh, massage therapy, those are generally limited to a certain amount, either collectively or individually or collectively to a maximum on an annual basis. Hospital coverage, you have the ability to secure private coverage or semi-private coverage, but understand that when you go to a hospital, the private room or the semi-private room has to be available in order for you to be put into it. If it's not available, you're going to go into a ward room no matter what type of coverage that you have. Travel coverage, anytime you step foot outside of the province that you reside in, you need travel coverage. So if you are going to go to Quebec and you're going to go shopping in Quebec and you have an accident in Quebec, what the reason that you need travel coverage is then you show your travel card, they immediately cover you and they go after OHIP for the equivalent uh, payment. Whereas if you don't have travel coverage, you get to pay first, and then you get to go after OHIP for that coverage. And I can tell you, I would rather have the insurance company battle it out with OHIP rather than do it myself. And that's why travel coverage is so important. When it comes to benefits, either for an individual or in a uh, group situation, there's likely going to be some degree of cost sharing between the insurance company and the individual. And the cost sharing comes in deductibles, coinsurance, or limits. So a deductible says that for the first 25, 50, 100, 200, 500 dollars, you're going to pay that out of your pocket. And then after that, it's going to be shared with the insurance company, either the insurance company paying 100% or the insurance company paying a lower amount. That's called a coinsurance when the insurance company, let's say, pays 80 or 70% of the bill that you're uh, submitted. And then you often have limits. So as I was talking with the paramedical, you can have a limit whereby you can have $350 total for all paramedical services, or $350 for Cairo, $350 for our, our massage, uh, $350 for physiotherapy, $350 for occupational therapy, natu naturopathy, et cetera. So it's either a per or it's collective to a maximum. Another way that you can have it is that it will be a dollar amount per visit. So maybe the insurance company will cover $20 per visit, which means that the practitioner, if they're charging more than $20, you're going to have to pay that difference. Okay. That's the medical uh, side or the health side of things. And then we looked at dental insurance. Again, dental insurance, there are three components. Your basic services, which uh, is cleaning of your teeth. Understand that there is a number of scales, scaling that you're eligible for on a per annum basis. So sometimes you can go to the dentist uh, every week, but once you hit 12, uh, what's the term? I'm tip of my tongue and I can't remember it. But once you've hit that 12 scales, from that point on, nothing is covered. Even if your benefit says you can go to the dentist twice or three times a year. So there's the basic services. Major would be uh, root canals, um, fillings, uh, anything that's not just cleaning and not orthodontics. And then there's orthodontics as the third area. Generally, what you have is either a basic limit, a major limit, uh, and often you have an orthodontic limit that is separate. And again, in the same way with the cost sharing for the medical and dental, same thing when it comes to cost sharing for the uh, dental side of things. So you have deductibles. So the first $25, $50, depending on whether uh, what the parameters of the benefit program, excuse me, are that you're going to pay that out of pocket. 
With dental services, most of the time there's going to be a co-insurance, meaning that the insurance company will cover, let's say, 80%, and you're going to be responsible for 20%. And quite often there's a limit in a dental program, 1000 1500 If you have a really high-end uh, benefit package, it might go up to $2,500. Uh, but understand that dental uh, coverage is going to be very restrictive. When, especially when you're talking an individual plan. When you're talking an individual plan, quite a few of them won't offer you coverage for the first year for dental work. And they know that the reason that you're looking at uh, getting benefits is often because you have dental work that you need to pay for, and they don't want you coming on the program, going, getting the work done, and then getting off the program. So they want you on the program for a period of time, and that's why they'll often uh, limit it to, let's say, zero in the first year, 300 in the second year, 500 in the third year, and $1,000 in the fourth and thereafter. So those are the types of things that you're going to see when it comes to uh, limits inside of a dental practice, dental uh, plan. All right. So as an employee versus self-employed, for employees, uh, if your employer provides it. You've got a group benefit plan. I've gone through and sort of uh, spoken to some of the items in that, but often a group benefit plan participation is mandatory, meaning that you can't say, well, I don't want it. You can waive it if your spouse has coverage elsewhere, but you can't waive it if your spouse doesn't have coverage elsewhere. The group benefit plan can be canceled at any time by the employer or by a union, if you happen to be involved in a union, they're not portable. What that means is that if you go from being an employee to from one company that has benefits to another company uh, that has benefit that uh, uh, doesn't have benefits, you can't take the first employer's plan and carry it with you to the second employer. So that's what it means: not portable. Most disability insurance plans as an example that are through a group plan you cannot port them to a new employer if that employer doesn't have coverage or you can't port them to when should you decide suddenly to become an independent contractor you lose that group disability when you leave the company okay again the definitions are generally very restrictive and poor in comparison to a personal plan the exception to that is the medical and dental. Group benefit plans have less expensive and more comprehensive medical and dental coverage. So that, if you have health issues, would be a reason to consider being an employee instead of being an independent contractor. The other thing when it comes to group benefit plans that I spoke about right back at the beginning of this evening is that the costs typically will go up year after year because medical and dental inflation generally run at two or three or more times than the inflation that we hear about on the radio, the consumer price index. So it's not uncommon for dental inflation to run at 10% or more. And same thing with medical costs, uh, especially you know um, in an environment where there are more and more designer type drugs, uh, bio uh, and drug, biopharma drugs, I think that's it. Apparently, I'm having a, a memory loss evening. My apologies, but uh, those are drugs that are going to cost a lot more, and so the claims are going to for group plans like that that cover it are going to go up quite high, and the insurance company is going to want to make some of that loss back, and so they'll raise rates uh, for the plan. Individual plans, those are for self-employed. They're also for employees. So you can take out individual plans to make up for the shortfalls that you might experience with a benefit plan through an employer. Individual plans, whether you're an employee or not, those are unilateral contracts. And the only time that... Uh, the insurance company can say no is when you're making an application for coverage. Once you have coverage, as long as you pay the premiums, then the plan stays in existence. The plan definitions are generally more uh, uh, 
um, less respect, restrictive, excuse me, in individual plans than they are in group plans. And there are a variety of different costs associated with individual plans. As I mentioned, they can be increasing, they can be level, and they can actually be a combination of the two of them as well. So for those who are listening, who are clinic owners or own a company, group benefit plans for employees, very tax efficient compensation as opposed to getting raises. And actually the employee will also get more bang for their buck, especially if they're using the plan. More clinics and companies these days are offering them in order to attract and retain existing employees. And it, again, it is not only tax efficient, it's tax effective compensation, uh, especially for executives who may be in a higher income tax bracket. When it comes to insurance for partnerships and corporations, you have buy sells, which means if you have a, another partner or another shareholder, two or more individuals, then you need to uh, put in place an agreement that says what happens in the event of death, disability, and capacitation for your partner, because otherwise you become either a partner with their estate or the shareholder is the estate, and you want to eliminate uh, spouses from suddenly becoming business partners because they probably don't have the skill set that you do, and they're just going to be a financial drain. The other thing is that you can look at is key person coverage. So if you have an individual who specializes in a, a specific area of physical therapy and is in, inter, integral to your practice, uh, then you might want to take out insurance on that person because otherwise, if they're no longer able to work, you and your company may be in trouble. I've covered a lot of different things. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna throw it open to questions and let me just open up the chat and uh, away we go. So let, I see there are a bunch of questions already. Okay, uh, okay. So Emma, hi again, Emma. Uh, experience with thoughts, feeling about edge benefits as a disability critical illness provider. Great question. So um, I'm not worried that it's very specific. As an independent broker, I have access to EDGE and I do implement EDGE benefits, but I only do so in the event that an individual is unable to uh, qualify through Canada Life or RBC. And the reason for that is that uh, EDGE is a secondary to tertiary player in the disability insurance market. It used to be underwritten by RBC, and then they took it off. It's a smaller company, less experience, and the definition uh, is also not as strong. And they can often come back. They can't cancel the coverage on you. But what they can say is all female physiotherapists, uh, we're going to charge instead of a dollar per hundred of benefit, we're going to charge $20 per hundred of benefit. They reserve the right to do that in the EDGE plan, and so I would not uh, look at them as a disability or critical illness provider unless that was what I was relegated to from uh, a health standpoint. All right, I hope that answers the question. Uh, ask if it doesn't. Uh, okay, specifically, so Emma has asked about uh, a neurodegenerative disease applying for life insurance. There are companies out there that will provide coverage for those who are on their deaths, uh, deathbed. The thing is that there are restrictions to that. Uh, for example, uh, Humania is a company that will cover you for life insurance. You're going to pay more if you have a neurodegenerative disease. Uh, and as long as you live two years, then they will pay the full benefit. And so what it's called is a pre-ex condition, where if you have the issue two years prior or 12 months prior, depending on the company, Humani, it's two years, and nothing happens in the first two years, you're fine. After two years, it's as though you were perfectly healthy, but you're paying a higher premium. 
But if something happens in the first two years and you had it in the preceding two years to application, they will only reimburse the premiums that you've paid into that program. So it really is a case of speaking with someone who is familiar. Uh, if you're looking at a, any medical issue, uh, if you want to know what's out there, uh, my health, uh, my medical rap sheet is quite large. Uh, even if you don't want to work with me, that's fine. But do reach out for those because I'm going to have a fair amount of experience. I'm diabetic. I've had heart issues. Uh, so most insurance companies don't like me uh, as a risk. And so I know the secondary and tertiary markets quite well. So by all means, send me an email. I'll be happy to look at your individual situation. All right, James has asked a question. How critical or catastrophic must an illness under critical illness insurance typically be to qualify for benefit payout? Is there, for example, is there a difference between cancer that is uh, geoblastoma, brain cancer with 5% five-year survival rate, and cancer that is basal cell simple? Okay, great question. So James, any critical illness plan that you have is going to have a definition. And that's the definition that they're going to go by. So geoblastoma is a life-threatening cancer. When you get, and may you not have, but when someone comes down with geoblastoma, the critical illness in, uh, as far as I know, all plans that cover cancer is going to pay. Now, basal cell uh, or simple skin cancer, most of the plans are not going to pay the full benefit. Some of them will pay a small lump sum, usually up to a certain amount to a maximum of, let's say, 50% of the overall benefit, and they'll provide that to you. Some will provide it and still pay out the full amount if something else occurs. Uh, you're starting to get into the nuances of uh, conditions. But James, realistically, each company has definitions. Take a look at what uh, they deem to be a heart attack. What they deem to be cancer uh, is basal cell considered a uh, life-threatening cancer. Uh, as an example, thyroid cancer used to be a life-threatening cancer. Now it's considered the equivalent of, let's say, a stage A uh, prostate cancer or a uh, breast cancer uh, in situ, I think it's referred to, which... Basically, what I say is if the item is horizontal, then you're going to get maybe a small lump sum. If it's vertical, in other words, the skin cancer goes deep and moves from basal to squamous, then all of a sudden they're going to pay because it becomes goes from a, a life-altering uh, event, but not a potential death, to now not only life-altering, but potential death. Okay, what else have we got here? Uh, James, what is the tax treatment, disability insurance, and life insurance? Does this differ? Premiums are partially paid by. Okay, so James has asked a great question, and that's the uh, taxation of both the premiums as well as the benefit. And so let's first divide between an employer paid and an individual paid. So when it comes to disability insurance. If an employer pays the premium for the disability insurance, be it through a group benefit package or through a wage loss replacement program, then the benefit that you would receive would be taxable in the recipient's hands. So employer pay, recipient is taxed, okay? And the employer can deduct those premiums in almost all circumstances for disability insurance, okay? For life insurance, you can have $10,000 and the of a tax-free benefit. So even if the employer is paying, $10,000 can be received tax-free. Anything above $10,000 becomes a taxable benefit for the premium and still a non-taxable benefit for the recipient. So either the employee for disability, employer pays, employee, the benefit is taxable. Life insurance, the employee is taxed on the portion of the premium 
and they receive the benefit. Well, they don't, but their heirs receive the benefit tax free. Okay. In general, when it comes to insurance, disability insurance, you have to have certain parameters. Life insurance, the only time a premium for life insurance is deductible, if it's required by a lending institution as collateral against a loan. So if you were to, for example, James, you wanted to borrow $100,000 in order to uh, expand or purchase a clinic, the lending institution may say you must have uh, $100,000 of life insurance. Uh, that's now required by the bank you or the lending institution. You assign it to the lending institution and you as, as a business owner get to deduct the net cost of pure insurance. So not necessarily the full premium, but what the actual cost of insurance is. And that is not always the full amount that you pay. Uh, to, to, to Emma, I'm glad that was he helpful. Thanks for your time. These sessions have been great. Cool. Love to hear that. Ali, is there any type of debt in Canada that does not get eliminated when you die, assuming no co-signers? It's not that the, uh, and great question, Ali. It's not that the debt is eliminated. It's that when you pass away, there are three paths that your assets will take or your liabilities will take. Number one, you can have a beneficiary designated on an investment or insurance or something like that. A beneficial designation bypasses the estate, okay? In almost all instances, it bypasses the estate. It's not eligible to be seized by creditors. It may still require inclusion for probate purposes. So beneficial designation is one way. The second way that assets flow from an individual is if it's in joint ownership with someone else. Not joint tenants in common, because that's like two, two people owning the house. You each own half the house. But joint tenancy means that you both own the whole house. If one of those individuals is gone, the second person takes over ownership. That, again, does not go into your estate. Only items that flow into your estate are eligible to be used against any liabilities. So if you have, a, I don't know, let's say a $50,000 line of credit, you die and you have zero assets. Your estate has zero assets that come into it and a liability of 50000 There is nowhere that the lending institution can access 50000 There's zero. Not going to happen. So they write off that debt. And your estate generally will go bankrupt and say to the creditor, which the lending institution is, hey, there's no asset here. If, however, let's use a mortgage. So let's say you own a million dollar home and you have a $500,000 mortgage and you're the only owner. Okay, so it's not jointly owned. You pass away the house of a million dollars and the mortgage of 500,000 go into the estate. Now, the executor of the estate, the person who is administering to your affairs at your death, has to liquidate the house in order to satisfy that debt. So in that instance, the debt is surviving you, but you have assets that are going to eliminate the debt. Okay. Ali, does that help? Yes. No, maybe. Yep. It helped. Okay. So hang on a sec, Lopa. Uh, okay, Lopa, what's the difference between beneficiary and nominee when we purchase insurance? Okay. When it comes to purchasing insurance, nominee is generally not the term that's used. What you have is you have the owner, the life insured or the insured individual, and the beneficiary. Nominee is only used in investments. Okay, and that's when it's uh, in the client name or in the nominee name, which would be a third party. Okay, and I'm not going to get into that uh, for this purpose of this discussion. So again, you have the owner, you have the life insured, and you have the beneficiary. The owner and the life insured can be the same person. The owner and the beneficiary can be the same person. 
when it comes to disability or critical illness, the owner is can be the same as the insured and same as the beneficiary. Because if you become, you own the policy, you become disabled, you're getting the benefit. Critical illness, you own the policy, you're the life and the insured. So if you become critically ill, it then pays you. So again, owner, insured, beneficiary, and the owner can be, the, a person can be all three, or it can be only one, depending on the type of insurance and what is being desired at that point in time, okay? Sometimes, for example, Lopa, if uh, a company owns the insurance on your life, then chances are the company should be the beneficiary because otherwise there are potential uh, tax issues that come into play. But again, you shouldn't be going out and doing all this kind of insurance purchasing and setting up without using someone who specializes in that area, uh, be it a financial planner like myself or an insurance salesperson. Uh, what you want is you want to deal with the expert in the same way that you don't want me designing your physical rehabilitation program. Okay. All right, we still have everyone out there. There's got to be more questions. Uh, and I'm glad everyone stuck it out. I was saying to uh, Ali and Amy before we spoke that uh, the chances are this would be the lowest attended uh, program. I'm tickled pink to see how many people uh, actually showed up, which is awesome. Uh, again, uh, there may be really personal questions surrounding insurance. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me. It's, uh, as it says there, Brian at BrianSchumack.com. Uh, you can reach me by phone. And failing that, you can also reach out to Ali, who will redirect you uh, to myself. And uh, I'm happy to, you know, be a source of information. Uh, I mean, if you need someone who has hair, I don't wear a wig, no matter how much you pay me. Uh, but I'd be happy to find you someone who I believe is going to work in your best interest. Uh, Emma, any red flags we should definitely look out for in a policy? That's a great question. Uh, Emma has asked, you know, uh, since we're all here, is there something that, you know, the buyer beware when it comes to insurance? Um, I would always be skeptical about what's being presented to me. I would often want a second opinion on it. Uh, unless I'm confident that the person I'm working with is indeed working in my best interest. Unfortunately, there are a number of individuals who will try and, as I said in the presentation, uh, set up an insurance program uh, suggesting that it should be used for savings. The more important thing is that you should definitely take a look at the policy contract once you receive it. You have 10 days from the date that you receive it to go through the policy. And if you don't like what you see, you can always cancel the policy and get back the money that you've paid. Uh, that is by law. Um, what else is there from a red flag? You wanna look at definitions. Um, you wanna look at, uh, you know, under what circumstances can premiums change? Uh, so James was asking, I think it was James, no, Emma, you asked about edge benefits. So there's an example of reading the contract and realizing that it's a guaranteed renewable contract, which means they guarantee to renew it, but they don't guarantee to renew it at the same cost. So they could increase it. The edge benefits also with their critical illness insurance, the price goes up every five years. So you want to make sure that you're aware of that. Because the last thing that you want to do is pay into a policy for 20 or 30 years and then not have it there to do what it was supposed to do from the get-go. And for example, there's uh, life insurance called universal life. Generally, it's a little bit less expensive than the other types of permanent insurance, but it's less expensive because one of type of cost of insurance in that is what's called a yearly renewable term. So at the beginning, I put that sort of dotted line where it kept going up. Uh, that's a yearly renewable term amount. And as it you get older, that cost becomes more and more. So if all you're doing is matching that cost, every year your premium is going to go up and it's eventually going to be prohibitive in cost. But 
if you were told at the get-go or if you heard that it was a life insurance policy and you assumed it was for your life, you may come into a rude awakening in your late 50s, early 60s uh, that, oh, no, now instead of paying $100 a month, you have to pay $1,000 a month for the policy to stay in existence. Again, it, you really want to be dealing with someone uh, who is going to represent your best interest. How you can uh, minimize the chances that they're not. Number one, I would make sure that the person represents more than one company. Why? Because if they represent more than one company uh, and they disclose to you how they get paid and how much they get paid, then you know that they're not going to only one company. They're at least looking at more than one company. So because all company, uh, a company can, cannot be all things to all people. So you want to find someone who represents more than one company. That's why a bank is the wrong place to buy insurance. All they're doing, or investments for that matter, because all they're doing is representing that bank. You want to work with an independent, ideally someone who has access to the marketplace. So an independent broker, uh, financial planner, uh, those are individuals that can access. When it comes to financial planner, it is not someone, someone can profess to be a financial planner, but if all they're doing is selling you an investment or a life insurance policy, and they're not looking at every other aspect, they're a salesperson, not a financial planner. The other way to determine whether or not the person is working in your best interest, the most important area of a financial plan is in that middle of that diagram, and that's cash flow management. It is the least compensatory area for someone to work in. So most individuals don't want to spend much time in that area. Why? Because they make very little money for working in that area. But it is the most important thing, because how in the world am I, as an advisor, going to recommend to you a dollar program if I don't know whether you have that dollar or you don't, how am I going to recommend that dollar investment if I have no idea if you have a dollar available every month or if you owe a dollar more every month? So that's why cash flow is really important. And the other reason I think that cash flow is so important is that generally people aren't taught how to manage that area. And so often there's a lot of money or potentially a lot of money that you're spending that you don't need to be spending. And then being able to find that money means that through working in your cash flow area, all of a sudden that dollar for that insurance contract, hey, you found $2, you only have to spend a dollar. Yay. Okay, you step ahead. Other than that, ask for referrals. Uh, you know, does the person work with other physiotherapists? Because although physiotherapy uh, as an independent contractor is similar to many other small businesses, there are nuances uh, that are applicable to a physiotherapist. Uh, as an employee, as a physiotherapist, yeah, you may be the same as other employees, but not always. For example, uh, you might have access to HOOP. Uh, and hoop being a uh, pension plan, there are potentially positives or negatives to that. So again, I mean, I can talk about this until I'm blue in the face. Uh, my home office is a little uh, hot right now, so I'm probably redder in the face. But at the end of the day, uh, get referrals and use your gut. You know, if it, if it smells bad, it probably is. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any. Uh, James has thanked me for uh, my donation of time and expertise uh, for all of these things. It's absolutely my pleasure.